Hi, and welcome to the Engineers HVAC podcast, where our mission is to empower and educate the HVAC community. This podcast is brought to you by Insight Partners and Hobbs and Associates, two HVAC commercial rep firms. I'm Tony Mormino, your host, and today's a special episode. We are streaming live on LinkedIn and YouTube, so thank you so much if you are watching. Today, we're going to be talking about AI, artificial intelligence, and its current and potential effects on the construction industry. And I'm so glad to have a AI guru here, AI champion. I don't know what to call you, Ben. We'll figure that out somewhere through the episode. But Ben, why don't you tell the folks here a little bit about what your involvement's been with AI and and who you are and what you do? Awesome, Tony. Thanks for the intro. Appreciate it. Um, I don't know if I'm guru yet or really if anyone is, but I think over the next couple of years, we'll figure out right. uh, kind of where everyone stands. But so my background was uh, mechanical engineering at school. And then I went into sales positions, project management, and I sold equipment for about 10 years. So I was a rep and kind of did the rep life uh, grinding away at that mm. for a few different companies. That's right. And, so you've been in the front lines as far as HVAC sales and design and things like that. I have. Yeah. I say most of my clients were engineers. I did work with some contractors as well, but I got to do a lot of really cool projects in New York city and in Boston and Mm -hmm. labs, high rise office, um, some federal government secret stuff. So I've been all over the place Mm. and done a lot of cool buildings, um, just from that construction background. Nice. Um, You know, as, as part of doing that process, I always felt like construction had some efficiency gains available and you know software we always felt a little bit behind compared to some of the other industries we had some like Mm -hmm. people i know that from school working for car companies or even just even within mechanical other industries felt a little bit ahead so i really wanted to pull some of these like kind of other industry knowledge banks and put them into the hvac world so i left that hvac sales space about a year ago and started developing applications Um, i have a co-founder as well but i learned how to code and I kind of try to bring some of these efficiency optimizations to life. Awesome. And you will talk a little bit more about what you're doing with that because we've used a few of your tools and they're pretty amazing. And I, I know from a marketing standpoint, we've been involved in AI. So let's start. Let's just start with the basics. Like, cool. What is AI? Like, <laughs> that's a great question. And I think it it means a lot of different things to different people. So I think you know, ten years ago, if you ask someone what's AI, they probably were imagining like the Terminator walking around um, right, you know, right. from the movies, Arnold Schwarzenegger. But nowadays, mm-hmm. um, we've kind of, it first was machine learning, and then you had these AI companies pop up around that. But AI as a concept is really human-like computers. And that could mean robots, that could mean things like ChatGPT that you've probably seen come up. But a lot of it has to do with data input, creating a model, and then turning that into some sort of output. Um, Mm -hmm. on the other end that's kind of the very very basic high level machine learning is one set of inputs creating another set of outputs so i listened to a podcast of a guy who's much smarter than me and he said ai is is neither artificial or intelligent it's kind of a misnomer because it is it is a program ultimately when it comes down to it but it's able to kind of learn and build on itself is that it is. Yeah. Well, and I think the a lot of the core of it, and at least that statement, what sticks out to me is probably like these neural networks exist. So when you create a model or something like a language model, you're really just creating data and you're structuring it in a way mm-hmm. that computers can understand it and then use it to create predictions for whatever your output is. So taking data in like a from a human perspective, which might be pixels or might be letters and words, et cetera and then mapping those into a uh, neural network, which is, you can think of that as just like a dement- as like a matrix with thousands of dimensions is mm-hmm. essentially what these embeddings end up looking like, but those, so it's represented as a model. So at the end of the day, it really is statistics. It's not thinking, there's no thinking to it. It's really like predicting uh, what the next pixel is gonna be or what the next word's gonna be in uh, ChatGPT as an example. Gotcha. Well, thanks for that rundown. And so, Let's talk a little bit about, you know, whenever a new technology comes along and I've, I've been on the planet for a few decades, so I've seen a few iterations of this, you know, when the internet came out, it was like, oh my gosh, this is going to ruin the world. Mm-hmm. Well, at first, no one understood what it was. <laughs> we, called it, we called it the World Wide Web in college. I don't know if people even know what that is, means yeah. anymore, but, you know, so there's always this major fear, you know, and then Facebook came along and it's like, oh my gosh, this is going to ruin the kids' lives. Well, now it's all grandpas on Facebook, you know, <laughs> and all the young kids are on the other platforms. So it's just like, there's this evolution. There's a initial fear 
of doom and gloom. And then there's also the fear of, is this going to take my job? You know, I've heard this about AI a lot. So why don't you talk about the fear aspect of new technology and then what it really is going to mean to people and their employment? Yeah. In your I opinion. Yeah, I'll give you my opinion, my perspective. And I think there's mm -hmm. different people in different spaces that will probably disagree with me on different points. But I'm sure that, you'll get a lot of comments on this one. Hopefully. No <laughs> right. The, the way that I view it is, is augmentation, not automation. And a lot of that mm. has to do with like what we're doing as engineers, especially is making subjective decisions. So that mm -hmm. could be pricing or materials or the sizes of something, or, you know, you might have context that a computer doesn't have. Like if a project's in Miami, you're choosing corrosion resistance for the air handlers because you know that it's next to the coast. But mm -hmm. if, the, if the data doesn't exist for an AI to be able to make a decision like that, it's not making a decision, it's making predictions. So anytime that you have like a human mm -hmm. being that's doing rational thinking or something subjective, an mm -hmm. AI might help you like, you know, com compile the data, display it in a way that you can easily review it faster. But mm -hmm. there's still a human on the other end of that that's choosing what's happening in the real world. So that's my like overview of why I don't think that we're going to see it completely replace a lot of jobs that are at least that are, you know, I'm going to call them thinking jobs or engineering jobs. Um, but what, what it is good at is it's a lot, it's good at manipulating data, taking inputs and creating outputs. So a job mm -hmm. where you, every time I describe it as like looking at the screen on your left and looking at the monitor on your right and then moving the data from one application to the other, anything like that can be automated to a certain extent with something like AI, but that's not your entire job. That's actually usually the worst parts of your job are kind of doing those tedious data entry right. type of tasks. So I, I view it a lot more, a lot closer to like a cell phone is an incredible tool mm. that can do so many things for you in your day-to-day -day life, but you wouldn't view a cell phone as replacing who you are as a person. There's still all these decisions that are going into it. And I view AI in a similar way where it's these, it's a tool with inputs and outputs, but there's still a human on the other side of things driving it and making sure that these real world decisions end up correct. Right, right. I love the inputs and outputs things and it's the, uh... It's ta it's task it's a task deal. It's a tool. Like mm -hmm. that's how I we we in the marketing group have used GPT Chat, Opus Clips, Mid Journey. But it's just a tool. You can't tell it to do something. It do something and you're done. Like it takes work to make it authentic and to make it right and to make it legit. Um, so, but you know, I would I've heard the term too. AI will not take your job. But someone using AI in the future might take your job. So it, <clears> it it's important. Like. You got to be, it's just like if, if people refuse to do email today, they probably wouldn't be able to work at most companies, right? It's the same kind of thing. And it's really not that scary or that when you get in there and start using it, it's like, oh, this is, it's just like probably what a word processor felt like, you know, back in the. Yeah, I think that's true. And I'll even 80s. go all the way back to like, you know, the first guy with the hammer could build a house faster than the person with the rock trying to right, hammer right. the nails in. So like every tool is just that, just a tool and AI, I don't view it. Um, as something that radically different other than right. the fact that it hasn't existed yet and it is going to be able to be useful for certain functions in our industry um, that we do we you know right now we're hammering the nail with the rock and then now we'll be able to use, we'll be able to use the I hammer know. i think the hammer and the nail kind of came along at the same time I could okay, be right, Maybe. <laughs> i wonder if the construction guys back then look at these kids with these hammers the end of the world and i was i was it was funny i was i like to look at history in terms of like new technology and new fads or, or the way young people are doing. And I was reading this article from, I don't know when it was from, I'm going to say like the 1700s, I don't know, but it was like the end of humanity because the kids were hanging out in coffee shops playing chess too much. Like that was <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, it would be like heaven today, right? Yeah. Ooh, like so, your, dad's, your dad's music is never cool until you get older. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's absolutely. Cool. Well, my music is cool. Like I, I don't I care what my that. kids say, right? <laughs> so, okay. So in terms of the construction process, how is AI affected it. So if I know it's just kind of getting started, but what mm -hmm. are some of the, in the, we're talking about HVAC specifically in a minute, but like in the construction world, how has it been implemented? Have you seen anything happen in there? Yeah. Great question. Um, a bunch of different companies. I'm going to give you a few that I think are doing some pretty cool things. Um, even some potential competitors of, of mine that are all shout out as well, but um, construction in general, it's such a wide term and there's so mm -hmm. many pieces from the very, first owner of a building who decides he wants to build something all the way to that building getting handed over and operated and even far years into its operation life you know there's probably thousands of different processes and people that are involved with getting that building created and built 
-hmm. So it's hard to, to give you like a single definition for construction as a whole, but I'm going to pick a couple that I think are kind of relevant. So one cool company is called Brainbox, and what they do, and I'm going to give a crude definition, but what they do is essentially they plug into your control system and they're running machine learning algorithms on the controls data to try to do predictive control of your fans or pumps, et cetera. So one example mm. is they might be looking at weather data and saying, we see that this it's going to get hotter in the next couple hours in your building and we know how to modulate your equipment to maintain set point temperature and actually mm -hmm. save energy throughout that process. Wow. Um, so that's a machine learning out, you know, processing algorithm, which is really AI that's, that's kind of doing those control sequences. And actually they're also taking one layer further and doing a more chat GPT like system. They just launched it, but you can essentially interact with your controls data intuitively, like natively with an assistant. So you could say, you know, turn up the heat of fan coil in this room, and it's going to have the data for those parameters to be able to run the function to make that decision. Mm -hmm. So seeing it just as kind of optimizing, like from an energy efficiency perspective is a, a pretty cool thing and a useful thing that even in your day to day life designing buildings or building a building, like you might not see those actual control loops being run and being like operated, but mm -hmm. the AI, there's AI systems that now can get applied to those control loops and help optimize um, buildings from that perspective. Yeah. So, so have you, how do you see like, you know, construction professionals adapting to these changes? Is there like a skilled gap? Is it kind of like, does it fall in line what we talked about earlier? You know, there's the older generation and I, you know, I'm 53, I'm not a spring chicken. So I, you know, to me, I, I kind of always have been open to the new technology. I like it. I enjoy it. I enjoy the challenge, but a lot of people don't like, they don't mm -hmm. want anything to do with it. You know, they might be just cool with, you know, email and, doing a search for the pizza place locally and that's their thing and that's okay. Yeah. So have you seen any of that kind of like resistance to it or Def definitely. Um, and I think that too, a lot of the onus is going to be on whoever's procuring these tools to put them out in such a way that it is intuitive for anyone to use. Cause mm -hmm. like on the first day it comes out, like, you know, there's chat GPT, a lot of people have used it, but there's a lot of people that haven't even touched that yet. So if you've never even heard of anything AI, Yet, by the time it gets to the people that are kind of the last adopters on the curve, you mm -hmm. want the UI experiences to be intuitive enough that anyone could kind of do it um, you know, without having to learn too much. But then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is the complete early adopters where like HVAC, we're not even like, it's like the tech people that are out there. There's Llama Index mm -hmm. and Meta and Amazon Bedrock and all of these AI specific tools that get created for developers to be able to make the systems. And right now we're in this kind of awkward period where there's all this incredible technology, but it hasn't really been brought to the masses yet. So if you're the person living in those gaps, then there is a lot of, there's a huge learning curve of being able to go take these existing systems and then apply them to um, different industries. So I think that mm -hmm. depending on kind of where you are on this adoption curve, there's different levels of challenges, but I view it as like the people who are in the trenches now building the stuff, it's on them to make it good enough that anyone in construction, they shouldn't have to go learn what a language model is. They should be able to use a language model to help their day-to-day -day processes intuitively. Yeah, well said. And I would say too, like if you're scared of it and you're worried about it, but you're worried that if you don't adopt it, your job might be, you're going to have a hard time doing your job in the future. Grab someone who's younger at your company. Cause I could tell you, my kids are teenagers and they're already all, I mean, their kids are using this stuff in school and college to write their paper. You know, they're very familiar with it. And I think they can give you a good, good rundown. And it's really not, you know, I kind of, I, I heard about it a little bit, but my friend had to really sit down and show me it before I Mm -hmm. got into it because i'm like if i gotta learn another program and another thing because can you know, i ask you a question sure did you ever use it and find that it was doing something valuable for you or like did that light bulb moment ever go off of like oh i can i can see how this is going to make my life easier in any specific way the first time i used it i was wow. like this is amazing for me and i'm talking specifically like gpt chat because writing you know we all this is a good conversation about like being self-aware in terms of if you're whatever you're doing, like when you're looking for a career or you're a content creator or whatever, you know, some people like to do video. Some people like to do audio. Some people like to write. I have to do a lot of writing or we do in our group, but I'm a terrible writer. Like I'm not a good at writing, but what I could do is just spew a bunch of sentences onto the computer. Like, here's what I want to say. And here's who I want to talk to. And here's the feelings I have about it. And here's what I think. And it'll, it'll clean it up. And then I can go through and do iterations to it. So again, it's not a 
you know, you could, and I think you could, I would caution people too. You can tell if it's not authentic. If you type it in and say, give me five cool things about, you know, the HVAC industry right now, and you post that it's going to be, people are going to know it's probably not authentic. Like it's probably something generated. So you do have to go in there and use it as a tool, but it's just like, it's been a huge help for us. Like this podcast here, we'll put the audio into it. We'll transcribe it. And then we'll create a description of the podcast, like create a description of this podcast based on this. You know, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. or create a blog post based on the conversation that I had with Ben on this Which podcast. Is the, so. in, the input is the script and then the output is a blog post. So that's like one example. That's all that's, um, you know, text to text. But that's a tra that's the generative pre-trained transformer. Part of it is the text to text input to output. So that's a perfect example of something that I think uh, AI is pretty good at doing these days. It's huge and it's legit. It's not like you're cheating because you've already, we're creating the content here and we're just putting into a blog form. We're asking it to put in a blog form and you go mm -hmm. through it. Yeah. So it's been a, it's been a cool tool for us. So very cool. Nice. Um, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, most of our listeners are HVAC mechanical engineers, HVAC contractors, HVAC techs. Let's talk a little bit about, cause I know you've been heavily in the, in the role of, you know, designing these programs for HVAC design in general. So why don't you talk a little bit about what you see there, what you've been, what's been going on in that area, what you've been working on? Yeah, no, great. Um, great question. And I think that, so I'm going to start with like inputs to outputs again. And I know I keep going back to that, but I think that it's relevant for mechanical designers because that's a lot of what you're doing is like, you're taking all the inputs, which might be context from mm -hmm. the architect or the architect's plans or, or data from a rep, and then putting it into your design and creating a design, which I would call the output and that's simplifying oversimplifying it there's obviously so much more that goes into that process from input mm -hmm. to output but you can kind of use that as a framework for how things might be able to help certain um back office processes is what i call them for you know different applications so one thing that i i've been working on is a submittal reviewer where the inputs is is a set of plans specs and schedules and then the output is a um and the submittal and then the output's a review of that so we're doing like a line by line you can pretend mm -hmm. like it was chat gpt where you entered the entire submittal as context and then you went through every line of the specification and then gave a compliance deviation exception for that so that's something that engineers we know do manually today where they're going through the submittal that they get and making sure that it matches the design that they did and i still think that humans are this is a great example of not losing your job because they are a submittal reviewer although it, it's great at getting data and even giving like an AI generated suggestion, there's so many things that are still going to take a human's eye to be able mm -hmm. to um, completely like say, this is complies. And I'll, I'll give you one stupid little example, but it, there's a gas burner that said uh, 20 to one modulation. And my submittal reviewer, uh, the AI predicted that it was a deviation because it said 10 to one on the on the modulation for the gas burner but there were actually two burners so any human's going to look at that and now right, okay, right two burners 10 to 1 each that's 20 to 1 comply but you know it's like that little kind of mm -hmm. nuance to it where the engineering decision you're going to have to be able to make those choices but the tool is going to point you to the exact location on the submittal that shows the burners so that you're not scrolling through the whole thing or control f looking for burner which mm -hmm. can make that review process just that little bit faster so augmenting not automating is kind of i think the name of the game uh, for a lot of these engineering processes. Um, I'm going to, I have one other point too, which is that I think that in the future, cause we're, we're like right now I'm talking about language models. I think that's what we're going to see first mm -hmm. is anything that's like text-based language that you could kind of help with your job. And like the example you gave of writing an email or writing a blog post, I mean, engineers write emails every day. So being able to write more concise, more professional, clear emails and using a, a, a language model to help you do that is probably a great use case for just starting with an AI application for your day-to-day -day job. In the future, what I see happening is as inputs and outputs get better, we'll be able to make models that aren't language models, but are maybe construction plan models or chiller models where all of the data exists in a form that represents a building. And you could potentially generate sections of a building or pipe drawings or duct drawings using a prediction of, of AI. And then instead of you manually drawing everything on the CAD, maybe you get something that's 80% correct or 85% right, correct. Right. And then like a template. Like a template, but then instead of you spending all those manual hours drawing everything, maybe it takes you half as much time because now you kind of have this template, like you said, to start with and, and refine based off of your engineering knowledge. See, if I'm a mechanical engineer and listen to this, I'm like, 
give me that tool right now. Like, I don't <laughs> want to, because it frees you up to do the more important creative mm -hmm. uh, side of your job. In my personal opinion, it's just a tool. You know, I love that. And it, it makes you a better engineer because now you could work on the actual engineering part of it rather than be a looker upper and a comparer of, of the techs. And it reminds me of, you know, I, I grew up in the, as a sales engineer, account executive. So reviewing plans and specs to do takeoffs was a big part of our job or we're doing reviewing plans and specs after you get the job to do the submittal. So what are the, what are, what are the tools you would see, or you're working on that would help with someone who's, I got to price this job. I got a set of plans and a set of specs. Yeah, cool. That's a great question. Um, I think that we're going to start seeing more AI based counting tools mm -hmm. and, um, I'm going to back up one second only because I think there's a relevant point to this sure, as yeah. well. But one thing about estimating that's very challenging is the fact mm -hmm. that it has to be 100% accurate. Like right. if you miss a fan coil, that's $1,000 or whatever it is out of someone's pocket for the job and it has to be procured for the building. So you need to have 100% accuracy for it. Something like uh, using a model to predict something that needs to be 100% accurate is going to be significantly more challenging than using these augmentation tools where it might give you like a, a tool that could count them faster. So mm -hmm. instead of saying there's a thousand fan coils on this job, I view it, I view the solution as being something like here's a chart of everything we think is a fan coil. All I, I know here, then there's 1,050 of them. And then human, you're going to go through and just look at each of these little boxes that we identified as a fan coil and, and pick which ones are correct or are incorrect. And that human review takes you from that 85, 90% accuracy up to the 100% accuracy. But that's still so much easier than scanning through the 50 mm. sets of mechanical plans to do the estimation correctly. Um, so there's a company called Creo, K-R-E-O, and they're focused around uh, like counting doors and counting windows, kind of the more architectural side of things right now using... ML estimation and they, they have a or machine learning um, to predict the, the shapes and then give you the pieces. Um, but that's definitely not 100% accurate yet. And it hasn't really been applied to uh, construction documents for mechanical equipment mm -hmm. specifically. So almost every single type of equipment or almost every shape of drawing is like a separate input that then we'll have to like you'll have to fine tune a model based off of that specific drawing type to come up with something extremely accurate so there's there's a lot of work to be done in that space it does feel like it's a if not solvable problem it's a problem that can be like in five years i would predict that there will be tools that will take um a five hour counting estimate down to something like an hour or less um Mm, I love it. Yeah. And ultimately the buck stops with the person in charge of the job. If you want to use this tool to make it quicker, use it. If not, go ahead and count all the, oh, I can't tell you how many, when I first started in this <laughs> industry, like, you know, we didn't have the small, we had the big prints, like they were the big, they weren't the 11 by 17s when I started. And I used to bring these big rolls of prints home and I'd spread them on the floor and you know, counting VAV boxes. I'll never forget that. Like on these big hospital jobs and they're just, oh my gosh. My, my <laughs> wife made the mistake once of saying, hey, do you need some help? And I'm like, no, you don't want to help with this. And then <laughs> finally I said, okay. And after about an hour of her helping me counting VAV boxes, she goes, yeah, you're right. You got this. <laughs> she never asked me for help again. So, that's, um, that's a great story. Um, so a yeah. question for you on that. Did, have you ever, did you ever make a mistake counting VAV boxes? Never made a mistake in my career ever. 100% <laughs> accuracy. <laughs> So I, I got think, to the point where I would be like, okay, there's 10, 10, 20, okay, there's 50 VAV boxes or whatever, you know, and I would throw some extra money in there because really as an estimator, it would just take so much time for the big important stuff. I would, I would definitely sit course. down and do more detail. Yeah. But, you know, you get to the point where you're like, okay, and I would even do, you know, I would take five box sizes and price them up and I would say, okay, there's 20 of these, 20 of these, 40 of these, 50, and I would just do it real quick. But, um, Nice. And I mean, the reason I asked that is just because I know that like our humans, we have these internal limits uh, and like we have some mistake percentage, even for something as mundane yeah. as counting or data entry or, you know, just you could you could count them all correctly and then type the number in wrong on your Excel sheet when you when you go to send the estimate off. So there's a lot of these kind of touch points that have human error involved. And I, I see those touch points getting reduced in the future mm -hmm. with some automation tools. 100%. So we talked a little bit about from a mechanical engineering standpoint, we talked a little bit about from like a, a rep firm standpoint for pricing jobs. What about contractors? Have you seen anything in terms of 
contractor use and pricing probably yeah. the same things apply to pricing. I got one. Um, there's a company called Trunk Tools where what they do is they try to pull in all of your data from different sources and then create these assistants for your data that you can interact with, even in the field via text message or uh, like kind of however you want to ask these assistants for questions. So what's what's happening in their process? It's called RAG, which is Retrieval Augmented Generation which means that when you submit your AI question to the chatbot, they pull part of your data that's relevant to the question that you asked and inject it with the query so that the response is based off of your own data. Mm -hmm. So said another way or a real life example would be if you have a folder on your server with a, you know project ABC and there's a submittal in there and it just got approved by engineer. So the project manager uploaded that approved submittal. If you're in the field, you could send a text message and say, hey, is the submittal approved for this project? And it's going to be able to find that data and then respond to that question natively saying, yes, this submittal is approved. Here's the document of approval. Here's the location in the document so that you can human verify it. So once again, it's not like it's you should never 100% trust it because there are things like mm -hmm. hallucinations and incorrect data in these AI tools. But it saves you from the pulling up your laptop in your work truck or calling the guy in the office and having them um, pull up that one piece of data for you. It's a much faster way to interact with the data that you already have. So I'm starting to see contractors who have tons of different data. They have controls that they're connected to. They have their service data for their trucks that they send out. They have their project management data. They have all of these different buckets of uh, sources of information all across their company, centralizing that and then creating tools where you can interact with your data more intuitively and get answers faster. It just speeds up the, uh, project management process significantly. I love it. Did you say hallucinations? I did. Is that an AI term? It is. Yeah, yeah. So oh AIs, AIs- They're more human than I thought. <laughs> yeah, language models are known as to hallucinate, which means that they will come up with information that may or may not be based off of real information or reality. So you have to always be careful with the mm -hmm. data that gets back. Like you can ask it questions about things that happen in the future and it might very confidently respond with something that it knows is going to happen. But really what, what's, and this is the thinking part of it, they're not thinking. What they're doing is they're predicting what the next potential word would be in a response. So when you ask who is the president of the next election going to be and it very confidently picks one of the candidates it's just predicting based off of all of the data that its model is based off of it's just saying the word that comes next it, it has not, no thinking involved with who that president right. would be no lottery number predictions that are probably accurate no my uber driver said he was going to sue chat gpt for giving him incorrect lottery numbers though so <laughs> i'm wishing luck. him luck i guess Good luck with that said, yeah <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure that'll go far. Okay, so we, I think we touched a little bit about this, but let's see if we got this uh, any more to say on this. So in terms of mechanical engineering firms, mechanical contractors, rep firms, what are some of the obstacles you've seen in, in implementing this? Yeah, I think um, hallucina hallucinations is a big one. And I think that so okay. being able to identify the data um, that is accurate versus inaccurate is extremely important. Another thing is uh, the data may be confidential. So there's a lot, some models will train based off of the data that you feed it during the process of interacting with the language model. And mm -hmm. if you're working on a government project or even just a client who doesn't want their data exposed, you need to make sure that the model that you're using isn't running, isn't essentially training on whatever information you're giving it. So there's, there's definitely mm -hmm. security concerns um, that are extremely important. And then one that I've run into recently a lot is just seeing engineering companies straight out say we're not no ai tools and we're just going to block it until we deem that this is something that can be used Safe, and I, yeah. I i think a lot of that comes from the fear that an engineer is going to like in my example of the submittal reviewer press a button take the output and then just say here's the output and then not put any thought into it behind it so mm -hmm. and it's actually good for people to, to know that it's a little bit incorrect because you can't 100 percent rely on these tools you need to think of it mm -hmm. as augmentation Think of it as helping you with something and then you, you're still the engineer making that decision putting your stamp on the drawing at the end of the day so it's critically important that if you're using it as a tool i'd say one of the challenges is not becoming complacent not letting it do the things for you like what you said of copy pasting chat gpt responses like don't do that you're going to come your right. people are instantly going to know and you're going to kind of look you know um look like a fool potentially so it's good to always make sure that you're monitoring the outputs
Yeah, I know that from experience. So <laughs> when I first started using it, I would, I would, you know, when I was doing a simple compare relative humidity dew point or something just basic in our industry, I would put that on there and I wouldn't, I would like, oh, it got that right, but it would, it would mess it up. It would get it wrong sometimes. So you got to really, so I spend, now I use it more as a tool to help me kind of, um, you know, structure my thoughts, what I'm trying to say, who I'm trying to say it to. And, you know, it's a great idea generator too. I have a hard time sometimes coming up with titles of like the title of this podcast. What I'll do is I'll put the transcript in and I'll say, Hey, can you give me five title options that are, you know, attention grabbing specific to HVAC specific to mechanical contractors and mechanical engineers. And it, 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 it'll give you, it'll usually give me like five or 10. I won't use any one of single one of them, but I'll take part from here, apart from here, apart from here. <laughs> But it's great. And it's always something better than I would have gotten if I just, uh, mm -hmm. scribbled well, it's, and it's almost brain. like a writer's block solve for you. It's it like, is, it gets you yes. over that hump initially. It's like, you kind of like, I, I was told to like write from your heart and your feelings and let it organize it into like what you want to put online. You know what I mean? Like you don't want to put a lot of that stuff online in the way yeah. it makes it more businessy. It makes it more professional. It does. Um, yeah. So I think we touched on this a little bit too. I had a question here about like energy efficiency and you had that great example of predicting the weather. The weather is going to be doing this. Let's go ahead and start slowly adjusting for that now. Um, so when it gets here, we're ready for it or we can alleviate some energy. What about like, do you have any other examples yeah. where this might be in play in terms of maintenance and or operational efficiencies? Definitely. So there's something called digital twin technology. Are you familiar with that? I am not at all. Okay. So essentially, like if you have a chiller that's going into a building, there's a digital version of that chiller that exists where you could model the chiller, all of the flows of the condenser and the evaporator and air cooled, the, you know, the condenser fans, et cetera, of this machine. And this digital version of the machine exists in like a 3D environment, but you could you can almost um, imagine like a 3D Revit building. You could have four different manufacturers all placing the digital version of their equipment into the building prior to any purchase or any installation of the chiller. Mm. So that is, that's digital twin. But then on top of that, you can model those chillers in the spaces and predict weather performance or predict performance of the different materials of the building to come up with this is the chiller that we think is going to run most efficiently over the course of wow, a year I love it. prior to a machine ever getting installed. So that technology doesn't exist fully today. I think there are manufacturers who I've heard of that are starting to look at it and starting to see how can we model our equipment digitally so that we can compete in these digital environments and hopefully provide the best equipment in, uh, that's physically possible. So I think that'll there'll be some really interesting energy saving opportunities for manufacturers mm -hmm. to take advantage of by modeling their equipment and um, for engineers just to make even better equipment decisions. Yeah. And you can even reverse that all, almost and say, you know, Hey, chiller guy, here's kind of a very precise profile of the building and how we want it to operate. And you could, you know, you, in, especially with the terrifical chillers, there's so many options with the mm -hmm. impellers and orifice and the tubes and stuff like that. Um, that's great. And I had a, we had a guest on uh, Mark fly with Aon. He's been on our show several times and he talks about like, building modeling is really the key to the future for efficiency because really a lot of HVAC equipment, you know, I'm sure every generation says this, but we can't get much more efficient, right? It, it, air cooled chillers have kind of plateaued over the last, I think, decade because we're at the point now where the inc inc to get 1% increase would cost a 20% in cost mm -hmm. and a 30% in weight. So the juice is not worth the squeeze. It's not worth the extra, you know, copper and mass you have to put in the machine, you know, water cooled equipment's getting close to that air cooled, like this package roof top unit on top of me there. That's the same way. And really the key is within the, the precise building modeling and the building construction itself, which is a whole other discussion, right? Like, mm -hmm. are we, are we constructing the buildings in a way that, but I think the modeling super important, um, going yeah. forward for that. I'm going to throw in two sequences are a big part of that as well. So like right now, a lot of sequences for HVAC equipment, like the control side, there's a lot of canned stuff, the controller that gets set in the field and there's a factory sequence, but they're not optimized for a specific building. So something as simple as morning warm up, if you just schedule it for 7.30 a.m. every day, you know, you might, you're probably not taking into account the fact that every single day the sunrise is at a slightly different time and your heat load slightly different. You could be turning on that machine three minutes later, four minutes later, which might not sound like a lot at first, but there's a lot of these kind of micro optimizations that exist in control sequences um, that I think we'll be able to extract more out of where you're right. Like the physical stuff, it is very, it's not only expensive, but it's 
very challenging because we live in a physical world and there's physical mm -hmm. limitations to some of the efficiency gains to be had. Although I, I've been amazed with like, you know, 20 years ago, the car fuel efficiency, and that's been like a big push. And that industry has come such a long way in providing, you know, you can buy a truck with a hybrid with like 30 miles per gallon these days. So that didn't exist 20 years ago. So I will be fascinated to see if there's any like real future forward thinking manufacturers that blow my mind and come out with something we haven't even imagined yet. <laughs> yeah, really. I'm sure there, there will be the other side of that too, as you were talking and I was thinking like, we need better training probably for the technicians running the building, the maintenance, the maintenance crew. Cause a lot of times what happens too, is you may, if you're lucky, you have commissioning, somebody comes in, they get fully familiar with the system, you know, and then they leave. And then maybe this guy closes a damper over here. He doesn't really understand what this thing does. So he unplugs it. And then two years down the road, it's all a mess. Cause even though it's got the new programs in there, someone still needs to get in there and maintain it and check it. Is it, is it following the sunrise? Is it doing all this? So there's that aspect of it. And, you know, I think the whole, the whole building approach is super important to the future of, mm -hmm. you know, efficiency. Cause we, again, with the equipment, it's like, all right, guys, stop picking on, I mean, we've done well. Like if you look at efficiency gains in equipment over the years, it's been pretty phenomenal. Um, and you know, the, the manufacturers in the red, we want the most efficient thing on the block, but there's a point where it just like, it becomes so expensive. It's not worth the, there's no ROI. Yeah. There's some cross plot of that's price right. versus efficiency that is optimal. And I've, I've always questioned the refrigerant, like, you know, choosing new refrigerants, like it feels to me like you, there's some cross plot there of global warming potential versus efficiency of the equipment. And I, I've yet to see like a great analysis on, you know, well, if every chiller across the country is running it with a more efficient refrigerant, but it has a higher global warming potential, like where does that exist? That's but right. that might be my lack of knowledge too. I, I'm not sure. No, you're totally right. There. I mean, there's, there's, there's not a lot of engineers involved in making those decisions. That's the problem with that. Like in our community, we, I just was on a podcast last night. We were talking about like, we react to the, the environmental aspects of this, but we really don't get a say because you, I remember when CFCs were getting phased out, they were extremely efficient. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the actual refrigerant that comes out of the machine is nothing compared to the extra CO2 that comes out of the coal burning for the, for the, for the, you know, the power plants. And that usually is not taken into consideration, but that's a whole other, we can get into a whole sure, other yeah. can of worms on that. Yeah, and I'm sure there'll be some much. comments about that. Everyone's got their opinion. And, uh, but you know, in the, in the HVAC world that you and I live in, we're just, we're just reacting to it. No one's calling us and asking us, Hey, what do you think we should do for the global, you know, um, environment? I have, I, I'll, I'll mention Mark Fly again, who was on here. He's kind of a liaison. All these big companies have a government official liaison who goes and talks to the EPA and they talk to Congress and stuff like that. And he's, <laughs> he says when he goes to one of these regulation meetings, it's him, 12 attorneys and a young intern engineer. Like that's, who's making these decisions and putting this stuff down. So it's not like, um, not a lot of engineering involved in this. So a few more things to touch on, um, privacy, you mentioned privacy with GPT chat. So can you touch on a little bit more of that? I kind of think I understand this because we were using the open free version of GPT chat for a while. And then we got to the point where we went to the paid version, which, you know, I'm sure all these programs have some sort of security concerns with them. You know, people want to put their financial data. We don't do anything like that. Like we're not putting a lot of extremely proprietary stuff, but we may start doing that with pricing jobs. What do you, what can you say about the security? What do we need to look out for? Yeah, there's a couple um, things to look out for. The first is whether or not the model that you're using is training on the data that you're feeding into it. So mm -hmm. if you go on chat GPT, I think the default is that they do train on your data. So you have to go into your settings and you can change it and turn it off so that they won't use the data that you're sending to them to train their future model. Um, which I'd say that anyone, any company that's using AI in any form should be turning that on. You don't want to let them have access to it, you know, the private, mm -hmm. especially the private information. Um, the next kind of interesting, I guess, and that's, this is still going to be settled in court, but, you know, they've trained these models on essentially the entire internet or ever the entire history of text that exists um, up until a, their cutoff date, which I think ChatGPT is like 20, early 2024, or late 2023. Mm -hmm. at this point. So if you're putting out anything on the internet, you, you know, even if you own it, 
and you have the copyright, there's there's a case that you know these companies are probably just going to still go use it, and it's going to be incredibly hard for them for you to be able to fight that. So, data these days, if you really like, if you want to be Disney and own your protection rights to all of the stuff that you create and produce, um, you really need to have a strategy going in. Mm. For, and I would talk to honestly lawyers at this point, but it's it's actually one of those things that it isn't so, it isn't a solved problem yet of who owns the rights to everything that kind of exists in the public domain. So great word of caution, you know, someone told me the other day, if you look at the terms and conditions, a lot of these platforms, they ultimately own the, the content you're putting in. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I guess the word of caution is to the listeners is be super careful. You know, if you're not, if you're doing stuff like we're doing, I don't see a big concern with it in terms of our marketing information. You know, if someone wants to steal our how evaporative cooling works blog post. And <laughs> I don't think the world's going to come to an end. You're happy, you're happy they're reading it probably anyway. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But well, uh, you know, but, it is, if we're putting pricing data and stuff on there, we want to keep that private. So go ahead. Sure. Yeah. I was going to say um, the output in the terms and conditions, interestingly, you actually do own, but I think there's oh, like a, the there's input. a rule of thumb okay. though, of like, if any company is giving you something for free, you probably are the product. So like Amen, Facebook yeah. or Instagram, et cetera, that's definitely true <laughs> in this situation where like, yeah, go on ChatGPT 3.5, use it for free. Right. Um, but your data probably is being used. I think you might even, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but you might actually even need a paid account to turn off the data collection feature. So um, that's worth looking into to make sure that you're, you're uh, covering yourself. Good to know. And I did, that's a good distinction between the data I, we put in versus what comes out, right? That's what yeah. you're saying. They want you to own it because they want you to spread it. <laughs> to spread it, right. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So let's talk to a couple more things here. So look, looking towards the future, what do you think is going to have the most profound impact on the construction and what aspect of this? Is there any one thing you can point to or is it just a total summation of everything we've talked to? Um, talked I'd say that the the worst parts of your job are hopefully the things that are going to go first. So mm, I think that a lot of great. the tedious data entry type of things, compliance, like those are the things that language models are going to be created solving. So look forward to that happening quickly. I would say that the long-term outlook, it's anyone that's pretending like they know what's going to happen is kidding themselves. It's like no one could have truly predicted the internet in 1993 or 1994. Um, when it was first getting going. So, you know, I, I, I'd be brash to sit here and pretend like I was, I knew exactly what was going to happen. But I will say right. that from the inputs outputs perspective, think of something like a set of mechanical drawings. I could see a, a input being text of, I, I need a school in Wyoming and the output being a set of architectural drawings that is a predictive of what a 10,000 square foot school or 50,000 square foot school in Wyoming might look like. So I think that those types of templates are going to expedite a lot of people's workflows. But I still think at the end of the day, when you put that stake into the ground and you start to create the building itself, it's going to be awfully hard to replace the human decisions that create a building um, in the end. So there's a lot of there's a lot of different input output type of day to day offices and the way I describe it, anytime you're typing something almost or moving data from a schedule into a selection software so that you can pick the right piece of equipment, all of those types of processes, there's likely some augmentation to uh, that AI could assist with, but don't look at it to, to go, you know, hammer the, the nail into the ground and start building the building. Gotcha. Good, good summation there. Okay. Now let's get into some cool stuff you're doing. Specfrog.com. Tell us about that. Tell us. I know we've used, we sampled a few of your tools. Tell us what you're working on and how you can help and how people can get a hold of you. Cool. Yeah. So we make GPTs for construction, which just means generative pre-trained transformers. It's like Chat GPT, but we're making little applications for construction specific processes. So our first one's a submittal reviewer. It'll give you output. Don't trust it 100%. Review it, but we do think it'll help you review submittals much more quickly and actually ch uh, catch errors on estimations for equipment as well. So there's a lot of different applications just for this kind of compliance thing of speeding up your current workflow. And that's kind of our day one, our day one piece. In the future, we'll probably make more things like a bid desk coordinator, um, the selection tool I described of taking, I actually wanna take an engineer's email asking for a chiller and then turn that into a real piece of selection data. So input being, give me a hundred ton chiller, output being, here's your uh, Aon air-cooled chiller that'll 
meet the specification. And I think that exists. I, I'm looking for manufacturers uh, that are interested in that kind of uh, application to work with. But I, I you know, in the future, we'll, we'll keep building on this stuff. So today, small company making some GPTs in the future, uh, who knows? But feel free to check us out, specfrog.com. And if anyone's just interested in anything, we're completely open to just talking, chatting, helping anyone. If I have anything I could do um, from a mechanical engineering or software perspective, we're, we're an open book. So feel free to you know give us a call. Yeah, and I could say our experience with you has been really good. We're just starting to learn the tools, and I like that you have an HVAC background because that's extremely helpful. Almost all of the tools, other tools we use are very generic to all the industry. So, you know, contact Ben. Ben, I'll put your email and the website address in the show notes for this podcast. So whether you're listening audioly, audio, whether you're listening to the audio version or, or the video version, can't talk today you can check out the show notes and you'll be able to get a hold of Ben. So awesome. Ben, yeah. So thank, so thank you for joining us. You'll have to come back and give us an update here. Cause I think this <laughs> stuff's going to be changing every few weeks or so. <laughs> it feels it? like it feels like I can, I can't keep up. I do it all day, every day. So very cool. Appreciate it, Tony. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you so much for listening. We appreciate you. Ben, hang out in the waiting room with you. We'll play a little music. If you want to connect with us, uh, if you're listening or watching the podcast, QR codes in the upper corners. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben.